Today, we were speaking to Michael Moriarty and to Schieffer O'Donovan on the recent publication of their books. Uh, Schieffer's book is enti entitled Yours Till Hell Freezes Over, a memoir of Kevin Barry, and Michael's book is what is said in the papers, The Execution of Kevin Barry. Um, I want to congratulate you both. They're two fantastic books. Um, obviously, they're on the same subject, but they are entirely different. Um, Schieffer's book has gone into great detail in the background and life of Kevin and the surrounding events. And Michael's is written of, with the immediacy of the newspapers and what the newspapers said at the time, a minute-by-minute minute account of the events leading up to his execution. So well done, and they're uh, uh, fantastic reads, and they'll be of great value in the years to come. So well done on that. So to begin, um, as someone who knows a little of Kevin Barry, one of the things that struck me in reading the books uh, is that Kevin, despite his very young age and his 18 summers, was something of a veteran with all of this, and that he had been involved in an incident, in an ambush in King's Inns, in which a successful raid of procurement of arms for the IRA uh, while with the Dublin Brigade. And in Tom Bay, he'd also been involved in uh, an incident in Ockavarna Barracks, which was synonymous with Charles Stuart Parnell and John Redmond. And maybe I'll begin by asking she for a little about that story of Kevin Barry's involvement with Ockavarna. Well, Kevin was brimming with confidence um, after the King's Inns raid. He'd gotten a Lewis gun and he came out grinning uh, ear to ear, said Dinny Holmes, like he had a toy. Um, so he was full of confidence. He'd failed his medical exams. He probably didn't really care that much. And down he was in Carlo um, for the summer. And he was involved then with the local company of the IRA. And so he and his brother and Matt Cullen, who my grandfather, Jim O'Donovan, interviewed extensively about, the whole Ockavana plan to burn down Ockavana barracks because what was going on at the time in Carlo was they were out to get as many arms as they could and to prevent um, RIC soldiers from being stationed in various spots. So Ockavana, the plan, Matt Cullen, uh, to go with Matt Cullen and a few of the others from that company and um, uh, my, Kevin Barry's brother Michael Barry to go up to Ockavana. So they went up on bikes and they went up with the plan to um, burn the place down. And uh, John Redmond's son was there with his wife. I think her name was Joanne. I can't remember right now. Um, and Kevin Barry went in through the window and apparently Redmond was there with a mallet. Um, now, I made an interview with a man called Con Foley in Nakanana, who was introduced to me by a man called Tom Kyo. So I did a lot of interviews on the ground in Wicklow and Carlo, uh, the last that we'll ever know of you know, direct people directly, directly connected to Kevin Barry. Um, and uh, he told me that his father told him that it was the housekeeper gave him such a, well, shouted him down and said, don't you dare burn this barracks down. And my theory is that perhaps it's because it was a place that was very precious to Parnell. Charles Stuart Parnell had been very revered in Wicklow and people, when he cut Parnell, he used to stay in Ockavana Barracks as a hunting lodge. So they used to light candles in their windows when Parnell would come to stay in the hunting lodge. So my theory is that she gave that as a justification, but that's just conjecture. Um, but it's very possible that it was this hysterical woman that uh, Matt Cullen um, spoke about in his account to my granddad. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. And it's a, another dimension of the Kevin Barry story, which in, I would imagine very few people are aware of um, and w would lend weight to, to him as a, as a young patriot. Um, I, I just put a question to both of you. I suppose inevitably Kevin was destined to become involved in the nationalist struggle. And could you, uh, maybe I'll go to you, Michael, first. Could you give a little background as to what would have imbued such a strong nationalist uh, orientation in him. Yes, and I think, I think the roots of that actually started here in County Carlow um, when he attended a school in Ratfilly from 1911 to 1914. After his father died in 1908, um, uh, Mary, his mother, uh, Mary Dowling, Mary Barry, uh, moved with the younger children to uh, Tom Bay. And he, at he attended, himself and his brother Mick, uh, Ratfilly School, National School. 
And at that time, the teacher there, his teacher was Edward O'Toole, who was a folklorist, uh, an old IRB man, uh, right, a great nationalist himself. And uh, he would have had a huge impression, I would think, on Kevin. Uh, it, it is an area where I come from myself. I come uh, reared in the next town's land to Tom Bay. I was reared in Canuck. And uh, all that area is very familiar uh, uh, with Michael Dwyer and the United Irishman. And he was a great um, uh, historical figure in that area and still is today. And also, uh, the United Irishman had two attacks on Hackettstown, nearby Hackettstown. So all this area about, uh, uh, and, 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 and the former King of Leinster, of course, lived in the moat in Ratfilly, which Kevin would have passed on to school every day. So all that would have, I think, uh, ingrained in him a, a sense of nationalism. And then when he returned to Dublin, um, um, his older sister, Cathy or Kitby, um, was uh, uh, very involved. She attended a rally uh, in O'Connell Street in 1912. She heard Patrick Pierce. Young Kevin then um, was already, I think, quite strong in his uh, nationalist uh, sense of nationalism and the sense of Irish identity, uh, and went to the Mansion House and there they heard, heard Bulmer Hobson give a, her, a great speech as well. And he actually bought, at, at a very young age, bought the uh, tickets uh, for that himself, for himself and his sister. But I think the context is also important uh, at that time because after 1916, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, execution of the leaders um, uh, was a, a terrible mistake by the British authorities. And then the deaths of people like Thomas Ashe and the Lord Mayor of Cork as well, uh, who was buried the day before Kevin was executed, Terence McSweeney. So uh, there was a huge shift from constitutional nationalism to kind of a more republican type nationalism. People, um, uh, people had shifted their position behind that and saw that the only... Um, attitude. The only solution would be a, a free Irish nation in the form of a republic. So I think there are the influences, that, from my perspective anyway, that uh, uh, would have influenced Kevin uh, from a very young and early age. I think the barriers were, were my, I come from the Dowling side, we're both relations um, of, 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 course, of yeah. uh, on the Barry side and my, um, my grand-aunt was uh, Kevin's mother. Uh, we would be seen as less uh, Republican than the Barrys, but, uh, uh, but there was a, a great sense, I think, of nationalism. Uh, in, in, in a word, people shifted from 1916. The, the population shifted in its attitude. And you could see that in the 1918 elections with the, with the uh, huge vote that Sinn Féin turned out in December 1918. Hmm. That's, um, and and your, your own feelings, Schiffer, will be the same in terms of the... Yeah, when he got those tickets um, for the Manchester Martyrs commemoration in the Mansion House um, in 1915 with Kitby, he was 13 years old and uh, they were so excited when they saw Bulmer Hobson and he said, Michael, and friends, uh, some friends, not many now, but Kitby in her witness account, she was very clear that after that they were committed Republicans. She and Kevin were committed Republicans after that. Kevin wanted to go on and join the Fianna Air and straight away at 13 years old and his mother said no. But by 15 years old, he had joined the H Company. Oh, you're done, yeah. I, I actually think that um, Kitby had a great uh, influence on Kevin. I do too. My yeah. mother always said, uh, that she was a, a mad IRA woman, the way she posted it, you know, and that she was very <laughs> radical, you know. And, uh, but, uh, and and at the same time, as being very posh. Yes, she, yes. She said this weird, contradictory thing. Yes. <laughs> you had the thing, there was a photograph of her um, when the family fell out for other reasons with De Valera. She didn't buy the Irish press, so she had two left. It was the <laughs> Irish Independent, the Irish Times. I think she went with the Irish Times to read as our daily paper. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, excellent, yeah. And, and I mean, who could have foreseen that uh, from someone as an outsider looking at Kevin Barry that the events of his life, uh, the events of his execution and trial coincided so forcibly with some of the most, I suppose, seminal events of the Anglo-Irish, the War of Independence and Anglo-Irish relations, um, that it, it, it is something that I suppose the family is ever mindful of ever after that so many things in November 1920 to begin that terrible month in, in relations to that Kevin's execution, um, that this has been something that has been in both your families 
to carry for the decades since, for the last century, um, that this, you know, this sense of having an absolutely historical character as part of your family. Um, I assume with both you, that's something that you'd never, that all the time this has been in the background of your immediate family and parents and so on, that, uh, yeah. Very much so, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Mm. And, uh, you know, you mentioned 1920 uh, and, uh, like, the War of Independence. The first all was established um, in 1919, or 1918, am I right? January 19... 1919. 19, excuse me, January 1919. 21st Jan. Yeah. yeah, the same day Salah had been. January 1919. Ambushed, yeah. And that's yeah. our Independence and, Day. Yeah, and, and the same <laughs> date was uh, uh, the War of Independence started, okay? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you had a whole uh, shift of people. If you just think about it, in the First World War, uh, the shift of people, people, thousands, you know, enlisting in the uh, British Army to fight for small nations and so on, in the hope that they would get their free state afterwards. And then now, now you've, within a few short years, you're looking at um, a republic, people wanting a republic. Indeed, and yeah. so, and the institution of the state, it, I, I, I was always, I, I learned this in my studies recently, is that, when the doll set up, it set up institutions as well, right? Mm. And people gave their loyalty to these institutions, including the IRB, or the IRA, uh, swore loyalty but, yeah. and fealty. So you had an alternative government, which was copied subsequently and admired by people like Gandhi and others, Absolutely. okay? Mm. It, was a, it, was a, it, it was a really, really good um, yeah. uh, move. It was a democratically elected government, and the IRA volunteers were mandated by that government, and the go and. The, and Dáil Éireann would, were, they had to be totally accountable to Dáil Éireann. So these, these weren't renegades, these weren't this was a democratically elected government with an army and that's the foundation of what we have today. So if we choose not to commemorate Kevin Barry and if we choose not to commemorate the independence of this country, the Republic of Ireland, we are then saying and stating that we do not honour the foundations of this state the foundation of the democratic parliament, Dáil Éireann, and the army of Ireland, the Irish army, and the institutions of this country. I, I would suppose controversially, and I question to you both, um, the circumstances of the, of the, the, the raid at Monk's Bakery um, and the subsequent death of the three privates. Um, do you think that the there was a great, there was a, 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 we'll call it a distinct lack of compassion in how Kevin Barry was treated, that he was sentenced to death. Uh, there was also very strong evidence, which is irrefutable, that he was mistreated on the first day of his arrest, uh, that he had been roughed up. And there was, a, that the British authorities were completely set against any kind of appeal or otherwise that they would carry out the sentence of death, uh, I, I, the pre, uh, that this was going to be carried out irrespective. Um, do you think that the deaths of Privates Washington, Whitehead and Humphreys, because of their young age, was a deciding factor in the British uh, reaction or was it a more sinister uh, feeling of, of, of a complete lack of compassion on their part of General McCready, the permanent to carry out this sentence, um, that was he put in a situation where he could not be seen to let Kevin, we'll say, off the hook in so far as the execution, or was there such a ferment within the British services in Ireland that he felt compelled that they had to carry out the execution? Um, what, was, what are your thoughts on that? Um, maybe I'll start with you, Schaefer, in that regard. Um, well, the first thing was that as soon as the ambush happened at Monk's Bakery, um, Colonel Topping, I think it was, of the Lancashire Fusilier, uh, sent a secret message to General MacReady, commander of the forces in Ireland, and he told him what had happened. And uh, General McCready's response was, try for murder. So in a way, it had happened right then. As far as he, now no, I don't think even Washington and Humphreys had passed away at that point in the King George's hospital. I don't think they had. I think it was pro the other private that had been shot and uh, pretty much, almost pretty much, uh, yes, certainly 
um, shot dead. So, but he made that decision, I would say, very rapidly because um, they had brought in new legislation, say, a month or six weeks before the Restoration of Ireland Act that enabled them um, to have uh, court martials in in Ireland to control the situations. They would already, they'd already brought in the black and tans, they'd already brought in the auxiliaries, um, thanks to Sher Churchill pushing that through um, in the cabinet very strongly. Um, so I think the decision had already been had already been made. It may look like there was a, a window for compassion when Ned O'Toole, Kevin's schoolmaster in Rathfilly, who Michael mentioned, um, um, he asked MP Devlin, who I think was from Carlo or Kilkenny, to go to the uh, to to, the, to Westminster and to beg Lloyd George for a reprieve. And apparently he did meet him and Lloyd George cried, but then they said that, you know, Lloyd George could turn on the tears very quickly. And when it came to getting an answer as to whether there would be reprieve or not, they all disappeared off to their holiday homes, including the king. They even tried King George and he'd gone off to his holiday home. So that was that. That said everything. I suppose I'm jumping ahead now, and that answered very well the, the view of the time. And, and may, it, it's an observation of but. When you go into Glasnevin Cemetery now, into the main entrance, the first thing you more or less see under the O'Connell Monument is Kevin Barry's grave, uh, along with the, around, around the circle, with nine of the forgotten ten, the other man went to Ballylanders after uh, request. And just in, in the parish I'm from in Castletown in North Wexford, uh, there's a man called Lee Mellows buried there who was originally part of the Four Courts garrison and had requested after his, his questionable uh, court martial in, or his execution on the 8th of December in 1922 that he be buried in Castleown, which he was. Um, it is an interesting thing that in all the decades after independence that I suppose the, the slowness at which Kevin was, we'll say, repatriated out of Mount Joy and given his, his due burial where he is, which was, which was done eventually. But was there a certain intransience over the decades since independence to now where we can look at these things, you know, through maybe a less emotive time, uh, as to why that didn't happen before, that in all the years that he wasn't given his state funeral, when people like Roger Casement were brought from England and buried in Glasnevin and so on. So, just an observation that what your thoughts on that is. Well, the big hiccup, first of all, was the Civil War. Michael Collins himself had wanted the bodies to be exhumed. Okay. And that was the first hiccup. And then there, there, were, there were other, uh, there were various memorial um, statues and windows um, organized and created and launched and unveiled through, up through the 1950s, from 1930, I think it was 1932, um, Mac O'Rahilly had organised the um, Kevin Barry window um, from the Harry Clark Studios, which is now in UCD in the medical building. Um, but then the question of the bodies, and um, it was very painful for the families, that their, the, the, for the mothers, for the siblings, um, the fathers of these um, these men who who were all in in Mountjoy. Now the graves were very well cared for, and Kitby well, did go and visit yeah, the grave a few much, times. Very well cared for, yeah. Yeah, they were, and um, that's a tribute to 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 Mountjoy. But there was nothing they could do, obviously. Yeah. So it was up to the National Graves Association. There was a lot of lobbying, I think, from them, um, from the National Graves Association, and then it just came to fruition. Then you know, as we reached, came into the 21st century and it happened, maybe you... Yeah, my understanding was that, that, that you had to get the agreement of all the families. I don't think that was forthcoming for some reason, OK? OK. That, that was yeah. one point. Okay. The second point is, you, you mentioned Roger Casement, yes, and, and, and the 60s, I think. Was it? It Early. was. I think yeah. it was, I think it was 66, yeah. 66, yeah. Well, I, I think with, with, with the, the outbreak of, of the civil rights uh, movement and everything in the north and the troubles in the north of Ireland from um, early 70s onwards, I would, I thought, might have deferred this, this yeah. uh, um, to, until until it was appropriate, you know, and appropriate was uh, 2001. Yeah. So it took a long time, but I, my understanding at that time from reading papers at that time was, uh, all were not in favour of it for some reason. 
Anyway, it, it, they were in, in the end. Absolutely, and, and, and is yeah. and but, pride of place. Yeah, um, but certainly it's, it, it, and that certainly would answer. Yeah, the the, the, the intervening decades. Um, one of the things I suppose, and again, it comes to attitudes from then and now. Uh, the the role of religious life and the church at the time of Kevin's execution, and it's it's I suppose it's it's. It's very absolutely integral part in this. Have have I do maybe Michael? I I, I found that the most in, in my book. Um, I found that the most amazing uh, aspect of uh, the all the events around the execution uh, wasn't just the religious fervor of the people. We have you know, these iconic photographs of the coming of man, you know, kneeling and saying the rosary. It wasn't just that. It was, first of all, the reporters in, in the newspapers of the day, the contemporary newspapers, the detailed reporting of, of what the priest said. Okay? And they said things like it was a holy death, you know, um, uh, according to uh, Canon Waters, who was the chaplain who attended at the execution, and, and also the uh, assistant chaplain, uh, Father McMahon, he said something to the effect, as far as a man can judge, he has, he's gone straight to heaven, you know, and that, uh, you know, he, um, he died with forgiveness on his lips for his, for his executioner and for everybody. And, and again, the, the uh, papers highlighted the fact that he was executed on All Saints Day. So we had this martyr image of a martyr, almost Jesus Christ-like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, who was holy, and he certainly was. I mean, he's, he has certainly prayed a lot towards the end, um, and I've no doubt, uh, I don't doubt what the priest said. Uh, you know, two masses in the morning, praying all night, um, you know, the invocations uh, that he used, going to, the, going to the gallows. But they said he was, you know, as brave as a lion and as holy as a saint. Yeah. Uh, okay. And um, his mother, uh, Mary, uh, was, you know, she said... Um, we don't regret, we'll miss, uh, we don't regret his death, right? And, and Kitby said he died for his principles, he died for an Irish Republic. So they were very supportive of, 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 of him, you know, and, and the death. And, and just going back on one thing, of course, which um, um, Schaefer will, will, will verify as well, is that the family were against any reprieve. Uh, we talked about a reprieve early, but they were against the reprieve, you know. He wanted to die uh, for an Irish Republic. And he wanted to follow in the footsteps of Thomas Ashe and Max Sweeney and others. Okay? Yeah. That is very, very clear. And Kitby, his family, were uh, f supportive of his wishes. And her role was to ensure that, uh, they, they were, um, that uh, his wishes were upheld. And, and that's what happened. But the religious, and, uh, and it was of its time, you may say, and the way, the detailed reporting of, of, of him. He certainly was extremely courageous. He showed no, you know, unflinching is what the papers call them, you know, to the very end, you know. Yeah. And he walked confidently, and even the priest said that the, the most jovial in the cell, right, while some of them, the guards who were with him at night time were sad, some of them, one or two of them were crying, he was not that, okay? But he was extremely um, um, courageous and showed great religious fervor right to the very end. Schiefer, have you anything you'd like to say about, my, uh, about Kevin's piety? Yeah, Kevin, I, as Michael said, was um, v very pious. And, and we can see how he was supported in his, his last days um, and weeks coming up to execution. He would have had the support of Canon Waters in, um, in Mountjoy Prison. He was the, the chaplain and Father Albert. Um, within the prison, but it, it was, Kevin had specifically requested for Tom Cunahan, who would later became Father Tom Cunahan from Belvedere College, to come and see him uh, very close to the time of his execution. So Kit B and his mother, Mary Dowling, went to Belvedere and they asked, because they didn't have phones, you know, you could just phone each other easily, so of they course, went yeah. there by foot, I presume, I don't know, or cab, and went to Belvedere and asked uh, Father Cunahan, uh, uh, would he would he go and see Kevin? And he did. And Father Cunahan's recollections of Kevin's last words and feelings and prayers around that time reflect, um, now that I've read them again, uh, like really a strongly pious young man. 
Now, interestingly, on the converse side, when um, Kitby and her mother and possibly Elgin, I can't remember, the, another elder sister, um, but she was younger than Kevin, when they went to Mount Joy towards the end uh, on, their, on their visit to his um, cell or the meeting room where they met him, and they met Can Waters on the way out. Now, I think it... I don't think it was his last, their last meeting with him. It might have been their second last or something. And Canon Waters said to Mrs. Barry, I can't understand. He doesn't seem to understand what's happening to him. She said he perfectly understands. You don't understand that he's dying for the Republic. Okay. So that was very sharp and clear, you know? Yeah. The other side of it, again, is that, well, the descriptions of Canon Waters, that came through a witness statement I found um, of... Father Lawrence, who was a priest in Clarendon Street Church, who the Barrys all went to Clarendon Street Church, it was near Fleet Street, and uh, his descriptions of what Canon Waters told him about the final hours of, before Kevin died, the night before being with him. A very tall, sophisticated looking man walked in, and Canon Waters thought it was um, a doctor. Um, and then he starts to measure Kevin's wrists and he was re measuring them for the pinions, okay. for the gallows. Right. So it became a very real to them both. That this was real. That this was no. the executioner, this was John Ellis and he just walked into the room. And mm. he was the one who was going to hang Kevin Barry. Yes, okay. Yeah. Who, who but they lived? were with him, the priests were with him, they were saying the prayers right up to the very end. You know? Um, she, for as regards, Kevin influences on Kevin. He came from a, a, a large family. Uh, he obviously his siblings and and and, and greater family seem to have a, a very profound effect on him. Have you anything to say about uh, basically the influence and who was most influential on on Kevin? Well, when he was young, um, at six years old, his father Tom Barry passed away. Now, Tom Barry was 20 years old, older than his wife, Mary Dowling, and that was very common in those days due to the system of marriage that had slightly changed since the famine. So Tom Barry passed away, and who stepped in? His sister, Judith Barry, unmarried, very strong woman, organised the farm up in Dublin, uh, the purchase of it, and the purchase of Fleet Street, and was a very formid formidable woman, but she passed away in 1912. And she would have, um, you know, being a strong matriarchal figure around Kevin. And remember, he lost his father at six years old, so there really was significant. And then there was the, the housekeeper in Fleet Street, um, number eight Fleet Street, who was Kate Kinsler, um, who had held back from any, condoning any kind of um, um, violence as a means to achieving independence, um, even though she had all sorts of stories to regale about the Invincibles and Skin the Goat. Um, but she was fully committed after 1916. Kitby said she came home and found her lighting an altar, uh, sorry, lighting a candle at the altar for the men who, when they were executed, and public sentiment had definitely turned, and, and it did for Kay Kinsler. So it's another woman with a strong influence over Kevin. She would have been cooking all the food, remember. You have to remember that. Um, Kevin's sister, Shell Barry, was down in Carlow, and she was in Coming Amon. I think um, Kitby was the eldest um, sister, and she had the responsibility, she says this in her, her witness statement, that she certainly would have very much loved to have been involved, as Shell was at that time during the War of Independence, but she just couldn't be. She held responsibility to manage all my mother's affairs, she said. Okay, so... She was a huge influence on Kevin and a huge support. And when he went, she went to see him in prison, um, he gave her the instructions. It was like a mandate. She said, he said to her, mind, he said, there's to be no reprieve. He didn't want a reprieve because that was a compromise. Yes. And she said, I'll make sure of it. Yeah. And so she, wow. she did. She, well, there were a lot of people making that effort, but behind the scenes, there was Kitby and Kevin and the Barrys going, we don't really want this, actually. Um, you know, and as Michael said, he was going to become a martyr, and he knew it, yeah. you know. So the women in the family, anyway, I feel were very, very strong. He had then Nana Dowling, who was from Drum Gwyn, the neighbouring townland to Tom Bay, yeah. his grandmother. So I might just... just um talk about her, I've mentioned her a little bit in my book because I think she's uh, really um, the quiet hero on this. And uh, I was struck by Thomas Clark's wife, 
uh, she attended and spoke at the opening of the current plinth in Radfilly to Kevin Barry in 1958. And she mentions visiting um, Mrs Barry shortly after Kevin's execution. And she said that no wonder Kevin was so strong, his temperament was so strong, knowing his mother. She did say, of course, etched in her face was the pain and agony of losing her son. But she always um, um, kept the brave face, you know. She mentions, you know, as I said earlier, we, you know, we, 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 we mourn, but we do not regret his passing, you know. The fact that he has died, I'm proud he's died for an Irish Republic, you know. Uh, she's quoted as saying as well that uh, he's gone to uh, 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 an eternal reward, or reward that many of us will hope for but might not expect. So uh, all those were quotes by her. And even when um, Kevin was arrested, there were to be no visits, on the, on a, and, a, and a, uh, the Republicans were saying that, nobody to visit, but she did visit. She used her mother's maiden name, McArdle, and uh, she dressed up and went uh, as uh, Mrs. McArdle to visit Kevin. Uh, and, and she did that uh, early on. And, um, but her, her uh, heroic strength, I think, was um, extraordinary. In the fact, she was kind of giving her son up for the Republic, you know. And as Schaefer has said, the Barry family, and that included her, um, were uh, very much behind that. Uh, and the Barrys might have been, you know, they, they knew that the Dowling side, Mary was Dowling from d nearby Drum Green, but we, we, we wouldn't be as Republican as, as the Barrys were. But there's still, according to Kitby in her statement to the Military Bureau, that we, we stood, you know, we respected the wishes of Kevin and his family and, and, and respected the mother as well, you know. So uh, you imagine, you imagine as she, as she did, her son, right, and you visit and, you know, he gives you a military salute and you walk down the corridor and you take one last look back and there he is standing to attention, you know. Yeah. Uh, you look at the pain in somebody's heart in that. So the exterior might be very strong, but I'm certain, like any mother inside, she was suffering terrible turmoil. Of course, yeah. It's an extraordinary image, actually, that she would have seen. And, you know, it's probably one of the most striking um, of Kevin's suit. Um, as, as a little aside to that, um, in terms of his, of his siblings and his, and his wife, how, they're obviously all long past, but did any of them, when did the last of his sisters in that pass in terms of, did they, are they long gone or? Um, well, Elgin Barry was still alive in 1918. She was Kevin Barry's sister. She was a few years younger than him. Um, she was still alive in 1989 when my father published his biography of Kevin Barry in, okay. use, in, in the Ilse Terrace where the window was then, the Kevin Barry window. Um, so she was quite elderly. She was a very elegant woman um, and uh, she passed away not, probably not long after, after that. Okay. There's a wonderful okay. picture of her um, that was taken at the time in the Irish Times, beautiful black and white picture of Elgin Barry with her hair in a bun speaking to one of her, her grand um, nieces or her, or her nieces. Um, no, there was a, definitely a grand niece. Yeah. Okay, so they she was the last to pass away. The last. And, Kitby and passed away in 1968 or nine, mm, I think. Yep. Um, Michael Barry passed away in. Um, in the eighties, I remember him myself actually. Yeah, yeah. Mick. There's a great photograph um, from 1958. One of the photographs shows them all at that stage: the Michael and his sister at the opening of the. Um, commemoration ceremony in Radville when they unveil the plinth that's there at the moment. And that's, that's really a great photograph, you know, and, and, and they're all together in that as well. So, um, so um, um, I suppose they carried them, um, I mean, uh, they were very aware of, of uh, the sacrifice their brother had made, you know. Sure. And I don't think any of them were ever going to betray their trust in that, in, in that, uh, you know, that great uh, devotion to um, republicanism that they had. Yeah, no, and that would, um, and, and it's quite interesting just when, and, and the reason maybe I asked that question is that as we're here on the very cusp of his centenary, which is going to be next week or the 1st of November, um, that, you know, that this, that the shadow is, is long uh, for the event and that it's only now that we're outside living memory, but that up to quite recently there were 
lots of people who remember this period, you know, mm. and that we're, we're, I suppose, we're at a crossroads now mm. where mm. It's, out, it's, just, it's just short time gone outside of living memory. Yeah, when I was a child growing up in Tinoc, um, um, you know, the fact that I knew who Michael Barry was, say, attending Mass or anything like that, that I knew uh, a, a, a much older man than me, he appeared all the time, um, um, and that I was aware of who he was, and that it was almost, to me as a child, almost a reincarnation of Kevin, you know. Um, that, that was the, how um, the impact um, it had, uh, the esteem the Barrys were held in the locality. And I always remember my aunt telling me, my aunt Lena telling me as well about the, um, uh, with her dad down at the Barry's, at the gateway to the Barry household uh, at the time of the execution, saying the rosary with the neighbours. Uh, and there were plans this year to, to repeat that, but unfortunately assemblies are gone now, so for the moment. But that would have been nice, a uh, hundred years to the absolute minute to have a generations three or four generations later doing exactly the same thing. But we might be able to do it in a different way, you know? Yeah. So, but they're, they're the kind of things that were important that I remember growing up as well, you know, and that Kevin as well, um, Kevin, who's hale and hearty at the moment, you know, that, uh, you know, he had a certain uh, esteem as well. And when my dad was from, was from Ventry, and um, you mentioned the O'Reilly's, and um, Elgin was married to one of the O'Reilly's, uh, but they, the, the O'Reilly's had a, a, a house inventory as well. So I used to meet Kevin and Evelyn uh, a lot there as well, you know, the current Kevin and Evelyn as well. And like, um, uh, to me, uh, I knew who they were and what they were, right? And mm. why, they were, uh, why they were held in such esteem. And the entire Barry family are for that reason. I, I suppose returning to the origin of... I suppose, how the Kevin Barry story unfolded. Um, the, the actual incident at Monk's Bakery, maybe she for you tell us a bit more about that and as to what the, the events surrounding that. Well, Kevin was supposed to be at a particular exam on that day, a reset exam. Um, and Captain James Cabinet of the H Company said, Kevin, you're not going to do this. And Kevin said, no, no. I have to do this. And there was a bit of tension until eventually Seamus Cabin agreed that Kevin would be there. And he, the next morning, he was supposed to show up at eight o'clock and he was there at five past eight and Captain Cabin was not happy about that. He said he went on his way, he went to say prayers, I think in Clarendon Street. So um, anyway, I'm not going to go into all the details of the ambush because that would take till Christmas. But, well, not quite, but anyway, um, the one very interesting that Captain Cabin did not anticipate, or well, certainly very much hoped, that it would not result in violence. That was not the intention. A shootout was not the intention. But because of the timing of the arrival of the lorry with the Lancashire Fusiliers and the privates within it, um, everything went askew. Yeah. Okay. And then somebody went up and said, uh, you know, uh, put your hands up or something like that. That was one of the volunteers. And then it was a lot of chaos and a lot of confusion, uh, which all resulted, there was shooting and then there was Kevin under the lorry. Now, he told Kitby at the recess in the court martial that the gun had jammed. He had a parabellum gun. He wasn't happy about that gun, by the way. Okay. Because it wasn't a great gun, it jammed easily. Yeah. So he went and hid under the lorry, probably trying to you know, free the gun. I don't know exactly. But a lot of the men at that point had scattered. And there was another bone of contention where the Barrys were quite annoyed with Captain Kavanagh because why wasn't a whistle blown? Why was Kevin not given the warning to scatter? Anyway, it wasn't blown. And Kevin was under the lorry. And a woman called, we later discovered, Mrs. B Mrs. Garrett, saw Kevin under the lorry and said, there's a, she screamed, there's a man under the lorry. Now, Kevin said to Kitby at the recess in the court martial, she, he said, she didn't mean to snitch on me. She actually thought that I might be run over by the lorry. That's how he felt about it. But the stories that went round about Mrs. Garrett for years were unbelievable. And when my father was researching his book on Kevin Barry, um, coming in the 1980s, 
he gave a lift to a man called John Doyle, who was our neighbour. An old man, very sort of 50s looking, long trench coat and big thick glasses and a sort of balding head, bit of greasy hair. Very distinguished looking older man. And he said, Donald, what are you up to? And then Dad said, oh, I'm writing a book by Kevin Barry and da da da. And he said, oh, he said, I knew Mrs. Garrett. And so he was able to say to Dad that Mrs. Barrett, she had, Garrett, sorry, had not gone mad, as some of the theories were, had not been run out of the town, had not been boycotted. She, she died old, uh, she died naturally. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. anyway, that was one interesting thing that sort of resurfaced many years later from my father doing his research. And recently, uh, I think Joe Duffy said that his grandmother had witnessed it as well. And many people witnessed it. Of so, course, yeah. yeah. And that, so that's, yeah, and of course they did, and, and even there's photogra photographs taken immediately after in that, and the place looks yeah, like a swarm of Yeah, there's a great photograph on Church Street, the crowds, is, yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's, so that was the story of Mrs. Garrett, and that's very, so it was really a case of a reaction and not... Well, Kitby in her witness statement said, oh, as we, we heard that she, she went mad or she went to a lunatic asylum. That wasn't true. Yeah. yeah. John Doyle said no that she she died naturally of natural causes yeah and the letter kippy sent to my dad in when he was researching this for 1958 she she demonstrated great sympathy for mrs garrett you know she yeah. she mentions that in particular yeah. you know and she mentions that kevin forgot his gun he left it in tom bay and yeah. he was issued yeah. with this gun and i think it was i don't think the the uh, there was suitable ammunition in it i think that's sure. why it was jamming you know and it wasn't familiar uh, with, and yeah. the issue of the whistle is important because normally when i think they would blow a whistle if they were retreating or, or moving away but it didn't happen on this occasion mm. yeah yeah and it would sound i mean if, if it was a way to procure to procure arms the last thing was to use yeah, it was a soft target, you know, yeah. you'd expect people coming, um, you know, collecting bread. Yeah. Uh, it would not be a heightened alert. The no, soldiers would indeed. not be in heightened alert, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and this happened every morning, roughly the same time. So yeah. uh, it, it, they were going after soft, soft targets. Sure. Because they were short of weapons themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And they certainly yeah. didn't want a, a gunfight. No, they did not. No. Precious no. ammunition. It's if, always a mystery who fired the first shot and why, you know. Is, yeah. yeah. So I would yeah. suspect it was obviously from the, the Republican side. And there were injuries the, on yeah. the you know, on, on the volunteer side. Yeah. Bob Flanagan went with said part of his his scalp had been shot off. Yeah. Okay. And he ended up in yeah. Jervis Street Hospital. Mm. Yeah. Um now he didn't die, but uh yeah. You know, there were plenty of injuries on the other side. It would certainly make sense that a, a, an incident like it with, with very young fellas with guns and very jumpy, who knows, in, in the long, yeah. you know, where, yeah. where the thing, yeah. and probably not intentional, any of it, but yeah. just a horrible incident. Can I, can I just mention one thing, just, just that, that I, <coughs> when I read in the papers, it's in, in the book here, about... Uh, how the, it was reported, every single detail of the execution, every moment of it yes. was reported. You know, mm -hmm. the tying of the legs, the spinning. Mm -hmm. The white hood. Uh, you yeah. know, the, how, uh, the hood over his head, he didn't want it, but it pulled over his head how far it went down, you know. Yeah. Every detail, uh, it's extraordinary um, style of reporting. Uh, and a, a huge, rich resource of... of, of um, the final minutes of Kevin's life, you know? Yeah. So uh, another thing that uh, in your book um, comes across is how intelligent he was in his essays and those are the UCD archive. At 18 years of age, now a 100 years ago, 18 year old, right? Writing on, on world topics the way he did, he came across as a great leader. Uh, 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 and I would have thought like, perhaps like Michael Collins, you know, we lost some of our best uh, future leaders um, in, in that war of independence or the civil war in, in the case of Collins. So what would and what could Kevin Barry have been other than a medical doctor? There's no question, but uh, he would have been a very principled um, leader and a great passion, a great belief. He stood up for his principles and he died for his principles. Yeah. You know, so that showed immense leadership at a very tender and young age. Indeed, yeah. And that's the... The what if of all of it, indeed. Yes. That had had he have, had he have lived. Um, so it's. Uh, and he had a incredible capacity to compartmentalise his life. Oh, so, yeah. the the fact that he was very re religious, actually, deep down, you know, that only came out later. 
you know, when we read the, the, the newspaper reports or the witness statements of priests who were there. Um, he was extremely committed and passionate and um, uncompromising um, soldier of the Republic. Um, and that was kept completely concealed from even his best friend, Jerry McAleer, in Belvedere College. He did not know yeah. at all that Kevin was in the IRA. Um, and then Kevin's academic um, achievements, that's another aspect of Kevin. There are many, many facets mm. to Kevin, but Kevin was also, um, Kevin, Jerry McAleer, his friend, was also not a drinker. So he did not know that Kevin, you know, absolutely loved to get locked. Yeah. And there's all sorts of letters from Kevin to Baptie Marr yeah. and all sorts of people about, oh, I was cycling down the road from, you know, Hackettstown to Glendalough. I fell in the ditch. It was so funny. And then I was up in the hotel in Glendalough with a yeah. Belgian girl. I had a, a whale of a time and damn drink anyway and damn booze anyway, you know? And bad hangovers. I think in your book actually <laughs> yeah. allude to that, all right, and uh, describing it. And he loved in great dancing and he loved above. betting and he was giving the guards in the, in the prison guards in, the, in, in Mount Joy, he was giving them hints for the bets you know who to put the what um which horse to bet on mm. yeah you know yes yeah, so the human side comes across yeah. in your book the human side mm. there, there is but Very your book human. and and yet i i and it certainly does refer to that he, he is quite extraordinary that he does seem to have separate lives yes. that don't and that that is actually quite striking yes that they, they're all i suppose even he's uh, the uh, circumstances had it but he's he's partially living in rural Carlow and he's also living in the centre of Dublin. And I that's know, another... and he's having a great time in Dublin. He's going to the <coughs> Grafton Cinema. He's going to all of the dances. He's going to the Matassa Coffee House. I mean, Dublin was great fun in those days. Not like today where it's absolutely miserable, but great fun. They had yeah. great fun, great socialising. And all the guys, like Frank Flood as well, he had his last coffee in Matassa Coffee House until he went off to do his ambush. And very sadly, he also was tried by court martial and then hanged by the same executioner. He was one of the 10, you know? Okay, yeah. Yeah, of course, Frank yeah, Flood. Yeah, yeah. Same age as Kevin. Fl Another student, yeah. Another student. The only went other to the O'Connell School with Kevin. Uh, for Kevin was there for a year. Was a medical student, wasn't he, in yeah. UCD yeah, as well? Yeah, that's correct. Very similar. They and I, I asked year. the question at the end yeah. of this book, why Kevin and not Frank? Yeah, that's a very you know what good I mean? question. It, it, um, it was, it's strange, isn't yeah. it? It's it's an interesting observation that with the now I know their age profiles, uh, the forgotten ten that, uh, called as they are called, uh, it is quite interesting how one of the forgotten ten seems to take precedent over all the others. And yes. I understand he's younger and so on, but as you made the no, observation, Frank flood, was the same age, and some others were nineteen, and, and, and they were very young. It, yeah. Quite interesting that uh, and uh, Thomas Trainer who. You know, large family from Tolo. Yeah. And, and Thomas Bryan, Boy George's great uncle. Boy George thought Kevin Barry was his great uncle. <laughs> oh, yes. He knew the song yeah. Boy George, actually. He sang it on television in, 19, in 2018. Oh, yes. He did. He, his, after his, Who Do You Think You Are, yeah. I, was it his, uh, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, why? Um, for, first of all, um, there was going to be great publicity. The, you know, this, this was a, a publicity coup for, for the Republicans, firstly, right? Uh, at that time. But then um, the uh, Kevin Barry, the ballad, written by author or unknown, we don't know who wrote that. Yeah. But uh, that that certainly hugely Im yeah. Im perpetuated his memory because it actually tells the whole story in the ballad from yes, start to finish. It does, yeah. Um, and and uh, and even that in 1972 was recorded by Leonard Cohen, you know, as well, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So so it is. It's it's well known, and there's a great story about. Um, Paul Robeson, who was um, 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 oh, yeah. a singer in America, and very famous in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, where he saw this car. He had a driver, but he was in a limousine, stopped to the side of the road. And I can't remember the Irish guy's name, but um, he asked his driver to repair the car. And uh, um, this man sat in and told him, uh, he said, I'd love to record an Irish song. And he told him the story of Kevin Barry. So Paul Robeson, who's a very deep voice, mm -hmm. he also recorded that back in the 40s, I think, or okay. early 50s, yeah? So it has done, um, it, it's an extraordinary thing when you mention that, that it just, uh, ha, that, that it is anonymous and that mm. nobody has been identified. I mean, it's obviously not that it, it is old now in terms of, but it, 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 it does seem extraordinary that 
Nobody yeah. ever appeared. Yeah. Said these, Nobody's claiming royalties. Is, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I find yeah. it amazing, actually, yeah. that yeah. no one claimed yeah. to have penned it. Um, mm. And yet, uh, that, that's, but it is, yeah, and it's synonymous with. Mm. Um, so that's uh, it. Mm. Mm. So uh, one other thing I was reading yesterday, it may or may not be relevant, but I, I was trying to see who was the youngest that was executed. So Kevin would have been the youngest, but the Free State in 1927 also executed a 19-year-old, okay? Hanged a 19-year-old, you know? Or was it 24, 1924, excuse me. Right. In Glenmalure, okay. from a, a murder in Glenmalure, nearby Glenmalure as well. Oh, really? So, yeah. so um, uh, people at that time were not... Um, uh, put off by age. No, you know? no. Yeah. To carry the sentence of law. Yes, well, indeed, you see, yeah. I suppose, as you said earlier on, mm. life was cheaper. Mm. And, mm. you know, all these young boys who were lying about their age for conscription as well. Yeah. There were boys as young as 14 on, in the trenches. Mm. Sure. And they were going over the top. Mm. Yeah. You know. And, and certainly the, tre the, the, the First World War and seeing the, the, the Commonwealth cemeteries in the Somme and, and in Belgium would the age profiles do sort of make it pale into insignificance when it's endless mm. teenagers. Yeah. Um, so I can see how it would, it would have, I suppose, yeah. caused a, maybe less compassion than what you would expect for, for mm. young Absolutely. fellows. Absolutely. And look where we are a hundred years later. Teenagers are condemned and scorned for hanging around each other on a street corner. That's where we are. And the courage those men had was mm. extraordinary like. Yeah. Young men. Yeah. yeah. And nice. the women. The women were incredibly courageous as well, taking risks. They were carrying arms. They were carrying messages. They were keeping cash. Kate Kinsler, the, the servant, uh, the housekeeper in Fleet Street, she kept a load of money during the Civil War. She kept a whole load of money down her, bre her bra. Um, and she had everything counted for when she gave it back to Kitby okay. after Kitby came back because she'd been in the Hammam Hotel. Um, there's a very interesting um, article written about it by a woman called Eve Morrison um, and Kitby's involvement in the Civil War, but uh, this particular incident under Cahill Brewer where he told her to get out and she said, no, I won't. And a few of them said, no, I won't. <laughs> and they had sandbags up against the door and everything. Okay, very interesting. Yeah. So their involvement later, the women on Elgenbarry was hunger striking in the Dublin Union during the Civil War. Kitby was out, you know, really gone into action, joined the Coming Amman after Kevin died. They yeah. were absolutely out there. Shell was already involved. Michael Barry was arrested in December 1920. Um, uh, they came to Tom Bay, to the, to the, to the Barry home, and they found him uh, hiding in the cubby hole where they used to put all the people hiding in the safe house. Tom Bay was a kind of safe house, Devil Air had hidden out there as well. But uh, Michael Barry was arrested and they found a ponytail. They said, oh, this ponytail proves that you punished a girl, which was a common practice on, on okay. the RIC side and on the IRA side, punishing, bobbing a girl okay, um, yes, yeah, for, yeah. for informing or whatever. And um, in fact, it's very likely, it seems, from um, our cousin um, Dorothy Dowling that, that that ponytail came from... Um, Kevin's aunt, Sister Cecilia, Margaret Dowling, that she had her hair cut off when she became a nun and it was kept in the house, but they found it and decided that he had done a punishment bobbing. Okay. So it was one of the Russian mm. reasons for his arrest. Right, in, okay. In 1920. So all of them were very involved then after, you sure. know, very in, interesting. In the, in the, in the, term, the traumatic events of, of independence. And a, the well, the civil war, yeah, was very difficult, so, yeah. you know, very painful. I think that concludes uh, this, um, and I w would like to really thank both of you, Shifra and Michael. Um, it's been very interesting and well done, and well done on, on uh, writing these two fine books. Um, as I said, they will, they will stand as a testament to, and a history to Kevin coming up on this, his anniversary. Um, maybe Shifra, you'd like just to tell, tell us a bit about your book and where it's available and so on. Yeah. Well, just very briefly, I, I wrote this after my father, well, long after my father died. He died in 2009, and he'd written a biography of Kevin Barry. And my grandfather, Jim O'Donovan, had written an unpublished biography of Kevin Barry. So I felt like I was sort of, it was up to me to do something. I, all I really wanted to do was get Dad's book republished, and that all became very complicated. And I felt passionately that I needed to write a book which showed Kevin Barry um, in all dimensions, in all his different compartments, uh, the fascinating, multifaceted person, faceted person that he 
actually was. So I was lucky that I had access to a lot of family papers and I had a lot access to a lot of new, newly released witness statements from the Bureau of Military History. Anyway, the book is there and it's out and it's available from Curragh Books. It's on their website or um, people can contact me directly um, if they just Google my name. She for O'Donovan, um, they can contact me and they can get it from me as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sheifer, and well, well done. And it's a, your, your father's book actually was the, the go-to book on Kevin Barry, uh, yeah. but that was always in demand, and it's great that, that yeah. you have, you, you have uh, given it a new lease of life, as it were, and it's well done. Thank you very much. And Michael, your, your book? Um, Mine is a more of an accidental book. Um, and the genesis of a book is not a large book, it's as big as it needs to be. Because the genesis is quite interesting. My mother died in April, uh, she was in her 100th year. Oh, and okay. in the attic, unseen before, hidden away in the back of the attic, rolled up in a corner, were these 24 newspapers, all from 1920. Uh, carrying extraordinary stories of the um, last weeks of Kevin Barry's life. I felt I read them, I was very moved, I really felt compelled that what your grandparents or my grandparents or great grandparents were reading, uh, I really had to bring it to the attention of current generations. So that's, 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 that's uh, my, my, my uh, book. It's called What It Said in the Papers, The Execution of Kevin Barry. Uh, it's available in many outlets throughout Carlow, Kildare and West Wicklow, but also from hillglenspublishing.ie. Well done, Michael. And uh, I have to say, it's, it gives a great sense of immediacy to the events of his execution and his final months, um, or final month. Uh, so it's well done and it is, it's very good. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much.